Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. Hey, if you are a part of the Explorers, uh, you are dismissed now, actually, upstairs. Um, but if you're not part of the Explorers, I invite you to stand. <laughs> and let's enter into worship this morning as we worship our great God together and sing these words as we worship him. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, rejoice. The Lord our Savior reigns, the God of truth and love. When he had purged our saints, he took his seat above. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, rejoice. The Lord fail, he rules o'er earth and heaven. The keys of death and hell are to our Jesus give. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, rejoice. Rejoice in glorious hope, our Lord the Judge shall come and take his servants up to their eternal home. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say rejoice. And we rejoice, and we ask that the Lord lead us, so let's sing these words together. He leadeth me, O oh, blessed thought, O oh, words with heavenly comfort fraught. Whate'er I do, where'er I be, still tis God said that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me by his own hand, he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Lord, I would clasp thy hand in mine, nor ever murmur, nor repine. Consent, whatever lot I see, since tis my God that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me by his own hand, he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. And when my task on earth is done, when by thy grace the victory's won, in death's cold waves I would not flee, since thou through Jordan leadest me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me by his own hand, he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Can we just lift our voices and proclaim this? 
He leadeth me, He leadeth me by His own hand. He leadeth me, His faithful follower I would be, for by His hand He Amen. Man, oh man, that's a good one, right? That is a good one. I'm so grateful for a father that leads us. If you don't know who I am, I'm Andrew. I'm the youth director here at NPMC. And if you are sitting in the center aisles, there's a black attendance book. If you wouldn't mind passing that to the outside corners, that just helps us know who's here and who's not here. So that would be wonderful. If you are a guest with us this morning, there's a connection form and it's found in the pew in front of you. Or there's also the QR code you can scan with your phone. If you want to fill that out, you can either take that card to the, to the table out there or just say, hey, I filled it out online. And we have a special gift just for you. Pastor Dave will be continuing in his series called Crossing Barriers, his series on evangelism. And this is part two of the series of the message that he started last week. So this is part two of that. So have your Bibles ready. T-shirts. We got some new church T-shirts this year, and so a couple of you I've seen haven't. There's a couple back there that haven't picked theirs up yet, so make sure you visit the table back there if you ordered them and haven't picked those up yet. But we are asking everyone who has a church shirt to wear them next Sunday because next Sunday is Kids Day, and I am pumped for Kids Day. So next Sunday, which is June 9th, Make sure, just as a reminder, make sure to bring a lawn chair because I don't know if you're going to be able to pick these pews up and take them out. That just might not work very well. So let's just plan on bringing lawn chairs because that just might be a little bit easier. But anyways, on next Sunday, everything will be starting at 9 a.m. where we will be having our Explorer Awards program. And then at 10 o'clock, we'll be having church out on the lawn. And then after that, we're going to have a... Um, church family lunch after that. So after church, we're going to have lunch. And then after that is when all the festivities and, and games and all those things will be happening. So make sure you invite your friends, family, neighbors, maybe that coworker at work that's got some kids. Make sure you invite them to come because this is going to be a great time. But there is still um, some empty spots on the table back there on some things that we need to have you help with. Because again, that event doesn't happen unless you guys step up and do some do amazing things, and you guys do that all the time. So again, we're just so thankful for that. Ladies, this coming Tuesday, June 4th, the Women's Ministry wants me to invite you to an ice cream social that's going to be happening at 7 p.m. in the church cabin, which is right the building over there. So today's your last chance to sign up. And again, there you will hear about all the upcoming events that's going to be happening that the women's ministry has planned. And so this is something that the ladies do not want to miss. So again, there's a sign-up sheet back there on that table that you can sign up to let them know you are coming. Man, oh man, summer camps are happening. And next Monday, June 10th, camp begins for a, lot of our, for a couple of our kiddos. So rookie camp will be on Monday and Tuesday. And then Wednesday through Saturday will be junior camp. We're sending quite a few kids this year. So again, if you guys wouldn't mind just being in prayer for those kids when you, when you think about them, that the Lord would definitely do something in their lives. That would be wonderful. I've got just a couple more announcements. Just as a reminder, this last Wednesday night is our last midweek before the, we have to take the break for the summer, so just keep that in mind. And then for our Hillbilly hot dog sale that we had last, last year, wow, no, next, yesterday. yesterday, we've got a couple things left over. We've got some mayo and we've got some hot dog buns that we didn't have, and so I was planning to use them on Wednesday for a cookout, but it's supposed to rain. So again, I just want to offer that up to the church family. If you're sitting there going, hey, I'm low on mayo, or hey, I want a hot dog bun, that will be in the church cabin after service today. And again, I want to let you guys know that the youth raised, I wrote it on my hand, $1,140 yesterday at the Hillbilly Hot Dog Sale. So again... But again, the only way we were able to raise that much money is because you guys stepped up and brought so many things for us, so that way we were able to raise that much. So again, we are so grateful for that. And one of the things we will be doing with the funds is we're going to be doing blessings in a backpack, which is just a local thing that we've done in the past before, so we're going to do that with some of the funds. But let's get back into some worship. Ushers, invite you to come forward as we continue in worship, uh, giving our tithes and offerings. Let's sing together. 
Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. I invite you to stand and sing. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, Still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. darkest day remains Jesus lift it up this we know we will see the enemy run this we know we will see the victory come we hold on to every promise you ever you are unfailing. Our God through the wilderness, our joy 
in the heaviness our way when it seems there is no way
for love's sake became poor. Tell him, here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. God will never know. And I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon the Thank you, Jesus. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Just our voices. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Lord, there's really nothing else to say than to hear, than to say, here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down, to lay everything at your feet, and just to say, you're my God. So, Father, that's what we do this morning. We know that you are God, and we believe that. And, Father, we ask that in these moments that you would continue to speak to us through your Holy Spirit. Lord, we love you and we trust you. And everyone pray. Amen. Hey, before you're seated, turn to somebody this morning. And even if you don't know them, just tell them God loves you, okay? Yep, I, thank you. Well, I just want to say this morning how grateful I am that you're here. Um, we've been going through quite a, a long series already, and I hope that it hasn't kind of caused you to kind of get off track any. Uh, we still have a long way to go. I, I apologize if it seems like it's taken us too long to get through this, but I think that this is one of those series that's so very vitally important in the life of the believers. And, and this morning, I don't make apologies for that. I just say to you today that I think it's crucial that we don't allow ourselves to kind of uh, lose sight and focus on what is so important right now, and that is a lost and dying world that so desperately needs Jesus. And, and how do we most effectively minister to them? How, how do we introduce them to Jesus Christ? For any of us who are in this room, and there are many of you who have experienced that, who know Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, you understand what your life is now compared to what your life was. 
and how critically it is important that for those that God places into your life, that they, they hear the same message that you heard, to allow them to make the same decision that you've made. And that's why this is so important. And that's why we're spending so much time and diligence going through this together. So I'd like to ask this morning, as Pastor Matt kind of alluded to, it is only because of the work of the Holy Spirit that can speak and to drive this through to our hearts, to convict our hearts, to put a passion in our hearts for those who are so lost. So right now, even now, where we are, will you bow your heads with me and let's ask the Lord to speak to us right now. Father, we just come to you with such, such grateful hearts. First and foremost, God, because we know that it's through your power and it is through your strength that, Lord, that we tap into that source that gives us the ability to speak truth in the life of others, whether it be through our words or through our lives. And Lord, I pray this morning that, that we not only hear your word, but, Lord, that we become passionate about your word and that that passion leads us to, to that which you're passionate about, and that's lost children coming to know you. Lord, I pray this morning, oh, I pray for each and every one of us, Lord, that there be a newfound passion for those in our, in our lives that, that don't know you, that we might be that link in the chain for them. And so, Father, right now, in these moments, would you speak to us? And, Lord, just give us, give us your wisdom. We ask this in your precious and in your wonderful name, the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, well, last week, if you were here, you'll remember we talked about some myths that we talked about. I'm not going to go into those deeply again today, but I'm going to just remind you of what those are, because though there were myths that we talked about last week, today we're going to be talking about some principles and some guidelines to evangelism. Um, remember last week, we talked about these myths. We said the first myth was that it takes a certain type of person to evangelize, right? We, we, th those of you who were here last week, you said the week before that was your week, because that was the week that you talked about living your lives and your life being the testimony. And then last week we talked about our message, the words that we speak. And some of you said, you know, I'm, I'm a live it kind of guy, not a speak it kind of guy or girl or lady. And, and I say to you this morning that we, we said that's a myth because in scripture it reminds us that we are all responsible for the message. Not just some, not just the extroverts, but the introverts as well. And so it's not just a special kind of person or certain kind of people. That was myth number one. The second myth that we talked about was that, that you need to be a walking, talking dictionary of the Bible or an encyclopedia of the Bible. And, and we said to ourselves last week, that would be one thing if we knew everything. But the reality of it is, we will go to our graves not knowing things. We, there are questions that we haven't even come up with that we're always going to have about our faith and about what the Scripture has to say. And so if we're waiting until we have all the, the answers to the questions. We'll never be prepared to speak the truth. And so you don't have to be a walking, talking, Bible dictionary, Bible encyclopedia. You just have to be a willing servant. And then the third thing that we talked about last week, and for some of you, this is, this is that story of my dog that wouldn't stop running around, right? You're the, you're the people who say, I, I get worked up and disappointed if, if I don't share the gospel with every single person that I come in contact with. I have to tell everybody. Listen, you have to be open to talk to everybody. But that doesn't mean that you're responsible for every person. That was the third myth. And that can get a little fuzzy, this morning, I want to talk about some things that may not seem so much biblical, which I think that, there, that it is, but it's also important that we understand how we convey this truth. How do we share this gospel that we've been learning about, that we've been talking about for the last six weeks? So today I want to talk about some guidelines, and they're not guidelines like you got to do this, okay? So don't, don't fall into that trap. But these are some helps along the way to help us to understand how do we pursue and how do we begin to, to find our way in terms of guiding and talking about this beautiful thing called the gospel. So if we're trying to arrive at this opportunity, right, we're, we're trying to get to that place where we provide this clear and, and concise message about Jesus Christ, our faith in Jesus Christ, how, how do we begin? 
Well, if we understand the message, right, and that's what we've been talking about up to now, right? We've been saying, what is the message? Is it about the church we go to? Is it this? Is it? it is about Jesus Christ. It's about what Christ has done on the cross. Well, how do we help ourselves to convey that message? Well, here's the first, and these are just some guidelines. We're going to talk about five of them, and then I'm going to give you an extra one, okay? The extra one isn't even going to be on Media Shout today, but there'll be five. And as I was thinking about this this week, I came up with a sixth, and if I would have thought about it a little bit more, there probably would have been a seventh and an eighth. And that is why this is part two, and next week there'll be a part three, okay? Just so that you know. Uh, I heard Andrew say there's part one, part two. No, no, not next week, the week after that. Andrew's excited. By the way, next week at Kids Day, uh, Andrew's going to be preaching next Sunday, so I'm so grateful for that as we're outside. I always look forward to listen to him share. Okay, the first one, five, five guidelines, and then there's going to be a, a sixth one as well. The first one is simply this, be natural. Here, here's something that we must understand. That, that understanding that we're all made differently, right? Okay, so, so I am not Pastor Matt, and Pastor Matt is not me, and I'm not Andrew, and Andrew's not me. We are all made differently. Some of you are introvert. You are people who it just naturally comes easy for you to be in the background, and other people, it is just very natural for them to be outspoken and in front. Now, brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter whether you're an introvert or you're an extrovert. God is not surprised by your personality. Listen to me again. He's not surprised by your personality. And why? Because he made you. He knows you. He knows how you're created. And therefore, we have to be aware of, of pressing one another, right, to, to get into this mode or this style of operating that it is easy for some, but it's not natural for others to do. So you have to find that way that comes natural to you to share. So, so much so that when we seek to, to move a conversation along with somebody who we're witnessing to, right, from what might, we might call that ordinary speech or that, all, that ordinary conversation, when we move from there to the spiritual conversation, right, it shouldn't involve this, this dramatic change of your vocabulary and your tone and all of those things, nor in our terminology and the things that we do. In other words, it's like, and I didn't know how to describe this, and I'm certainly not a computer guy, but it's almost like changing the font of our speaking like we change the font on the computer, right? So like when you want to make something with emphasis behind it, you'll change the font on your computer. Just because you're speaking about Jesus Christ doesn't mean you go into this whole spiel that looks different than what you just started with. Now I know that that may not sound quite right, but I'm going to give you an example of it. There's two people, when I, when I think about people who have taught me about shepherding, that means being a pastor, shepherding the flock, there was, there was a, a pastor at camp, at Prairie Camp one year, who taught on that. And I, I gleaned so much from that. He was the one who taught it. And Pastor John Moran, my, my previous uh, senior pastor, he's the one that showed it to me. And one of the things about this pastor at camp, and I want to give all this credit to him, he, he shared so much about what it meant to be a shepherd. But the one thing that astonished me about him, because I would grab a hold of him, and that was not my character to, to ask the speaker to talk to him afterwards, you know, and take up his time. I don't mean to be that kind of person. But I, I just couldn't get enough of him. I couldn't get enough of what he had to say. But the one thing that I always thought was so strange is that in our casual conversations, like one-on-one, -on -one, he'd be talking about his relationship with God and things of that nature. But then when he got behind the pulpit, I want you to imagine this guy. He's an elderly gentleman. He's, he's white-haired like I am, but he had this white beard that just flowed down. I mean, it was just, it was as white as snow. And he'd get up and like, his messages like were like an hour and a half long, okay? Just so that you know. And the reason why they were an hour and a half long was because for him to just say God took him like 15 minutes. So like he's talking and he's preaching and all of a sudden he'll then say, and God. And I'm like, what did he just say? God. Every time he said God, it's the way it came out. Now, I am not here to be critical. In no way am I trying to say, it was just strange to me. 
Because brothers and sisters, let me explain this to you. You're having a conversation with somebody, right? You're having maybe a really good long conversation. Maybe with somebody that you've had a good long contact with or maybe a short contact with. It doesn't matter. But, but whatever it is that they've gleaned from you or gleaned from me that you have an interest in Jesus or, or maybe that you're one of those Christians and they start asking themselves questions about, hey, are you religious? Are you a Christian? Have, have you interest in the Bible and that kind of thing? And someone beside of you starts talking to you and you've had, had a good conversation up to this point. Everything's going great. And now they ask questions like this. What brought this about in your life? What was it that, uh, that, that caused you to reach the position that you're at right now? And then you throw out something like, well, I tried the broken cisterns and the water failed. And you look at that and you say, what? What do you do with broken cisterns? And why did the water fail, right? I mean, so far, your conversation has been great. They understand everything that you have to say. But now you're talking cisterns and waters that fail. And they said, no, no, wait a minute. How would you explain the change in your life, right? Oh, well, if you want to know about the change in my life, let me tell you about it. I was, I was dead in my transgressions. And I was dead in my sins. I, I was in need of justification. I was in need of sanctification and glorification. And now blessed assurance I have, right? You know, I'm redeemed. I'm declared righteous. I'm raised to the heavenlies. Now, when you're having that conversations with those folks, those people that were sitting right beside of you, notice the direction that they go after you get done with that little spiel. And all of, a, all of a sudden, you start noticing, you know what? They're not here anymore. Because something happened to you. Because now they're saying they are dead sure that whatever happened to you, they certainly don't want that to happen to them, right? Because something has happened. The conversation had been going so great. You talked about the weather. You talked about what is this Putin thing and Ukraine thing and what's going on in Israel. And all these things seem to be going good. But all of a sudden you move into the spiritual discussion and the Christians freak out. It's like they don't know what to say. And then they start going down this spiel that changes everything. You change your voice. You change your vocabulary. And brothers and sisters, this happens more than what you know. In fact, I can tell you, I'm guilty of that. I have found myself over and over again, especially early on in my ministry, where when the opportunities came my way, what I wanted to do was I wanted to talk to them about the Trinity. I wanted to talk about the second coming of Christ. I wanted to make sure that they had the tribulation down pat. I wanted to make sure they understood the judgment seat of Christ, the great white throne of judgment, Armageddon. I wanted them to know. But all they really want to know to start out with is, what is it that's different about you? What caused you to come to this place that you accepted Jesus Christ? Because they saw something in you. They've seen how you've lived your life and now you have the opportunity to share Jesus. And half the vocabulary and half the stuff that you said, they don't even understand. I'm not saying it's not important. I'm saying that, that you need to make sure that you're concise in what it is that you think you need to say. And let it be natural. Let it be coming from the personality and the temperament that you have. I'm not you, and you're not me. And how you do it is because of the way that God designed you. That's the first. So number one, we need to be natural. Number two, we should be listening. Man, can I tell you, that's a hard one. If I'm being very honest, it's, it happens so often where you used to have a conversation with somebody. Anybody ever notice that when you're talking to somebody, you can just tell they're just waiting for you to pause so they can begin to speak? You ever seen people like that? That happens to us all the time. And again, it's so hard for us because when we listen, here's what's hard to understand. When we listen, we find out what worries our friends and our neighbors, right? We, we begin to understand what's going on in their life. When we listen to them, we find out what their interests are, what their convictions are, what their belief system is. We find out what standard of living they have and, and the way that they, they raise their children and their background. We learn these things. As simple and as obvious as it may seem, 
One of the reasons why we falter in our zeal to to share the good news in our faith is not simply as a result of not being natural, or I should say being unnatural, but it's because we simply don't listen. We don't listen. And folks, it's okay to take the time to know those people that God has placed in your life. You're not always gonna have that opportunity. Sometimes your opportunity is only gonna be for a moment, and that has to change a little. But when God places people in your life, it's okay to get to know them. Learn something about them. So we have to be natural. We have to listen. And third, we have to be vulnerable. And what I mean by that is, we have to be vulnerable enough to get ourselves out of our Christian cliques. I don't mean... you. I don't want any emails this week about the whole Christian click thing, okay? So I don't want us to go there. But be vulnerable enough that we get out of our gangs for a little bit. And what I mean by that is for some of you, you're in the workforce, for some of you are in school, and that means that you don't have to at every lunch break eat with all of your Christian friends. It doesn't mean that all your sporting events or all the activities that you do outside of your home is only with your Christian friends. You have to develop relationships with people who don't know Jesus. I mean, ask yourself, what in the world do you expect is going to happen if you don't allow yourself the opportunity to share your faith with people and spend time with people who don't know Jesus? How do you expect that conversation to go? And here's what I know. I know it's comfortable. I know that it's good. And I know that it's necessary for us to spend time with other believers. It's important to enjoy all of that fellowship. Uh, It is important that we gather like this on Sunday with other believers. But it can't be exclusively our lifestyle. It can't be that we completely avoid everybody else to live just in our little Christian bubbles. Because vulnerability creates opportunity for us to speak Christ in other people's life. And by the way, that's what happened in John chapter 4. Now, we've talked a lot about John chapter 4 during this series. Jesus goes to the well. He sees this Samaritan woman who's at the well and this encounter that he has. And by the way, I will tell you, John chapter 4 is a beautiful place to start when you're talking about witnessing to somebody who doesn't know Jesus Christ. But when, but when you see the story, there's something that's really important about the vulnerability that takes place in Jesus. Because when you think about it, he... He lets his buddies, he lets his disciples, if you think about this, go into town. All of them. He stays behind. Now, can you imagine how that conversation might have come up with his disciples? They said, well, you know, we'll go get food, Jesus. Do you want one of us to stay behind with you so that we can just have somebody to talk to? And Jesus says something like, no, I'll be just fine. You guys go ahead. Uh, And then he has this conversation. He has this conversation with this woman, a lady who came to draw water at the wrong time of the day or or a different kind of time of the day and certainly a different kind of lifestyle that she lived too. Now, I say that he's vulnerable because this. Have you ever wondered? You think about this idea that as he's sitting there and he's talking to this lady, what that conversation could have looked like, how it could have gone in a completely different direction if, if, the, if her reaction had not have been what it was. Let me ask you, have you ever wondered how many of your non-Christian friends would be itching to ask you a question, but they can't just because you're always around other people who are Christians? You ever wonder that? There are people who maybe who are always wondering what you think about your faith and about your journey, and then you never have the opportunity to do it because you're always with those other people. You have to be, you have to be natural. You have to be a listener and you have to be vulnerable. I think about what Jesus did, and I think about how that question that he asked her, do you remember what the question was? He says to her, would you give me a drink of water? And she could have said, hey, you don't talk to me. Get out of here. He set himself up to be rejected, but he made himself vulnerable to have a conversation with her. And that vulnerability changed the whole outcome of that conversation, led her to a place of accepting him and knowing him as Lord and Savior. Here's the the fourth one. Be brave. I know that that sounds like a given, 
You know, we're all Christians, so we're all brave. But Paul talks very clearly about how we're not always, in the beginning, brave people to speak about Jesus. In fact, Paul says this when he's writing to Timothy. He says this in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 7 to 8. He says, 7 to 8, he says, For the Spirit God gave us, gave us, I'm sorry, for the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, he says, love and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Sometimes we have to remind ourselves that we need to be brave. I, I, I am still, to this very day, I'm not ashamed to say it to you. I sit in this front pew every single Sunday, and I have to remind myself to be brave, to know that that God, what you've given us, this word, is so powerful that, that I don't have to be ashamed of it, that it is there, and it is right, and it is true, and it is unchanging. So be brave. Don't be a coward about your faith. The door is wide open. So be brave. Paul says this about the Philippians. He says this in Philippians chapter 1, verse 14. He says, and because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident. What does that mean? It means that beforehand, they weren't confident. The fact that there was a time that they weren't prepared to share in boldness and fearlessness. And I think that's true for most of us. And I will tell you, and I think this is true, that for, most, for the most part, the toughest of our non-Christian friends are more scared of us than we are of them. Because we have an answer that they don't have. We have something that they haven't been able to acquire. Our life is different, and they don't understand why. You can understand why that they're a little bit more like that. When Jesus initiated that conversation, not only was he natural, not only was he listening to her, not only was he vulnerable, but he was brave. And brothers and sisters, I say to you today, he was brave enough to talk to a lady that wasn't normal because men didn't talk to women. He was brave when it came to the fact that he didn't know. It, it, here he is. He's a man of a different religion than hers. His conversation that he's going to have with her is about something that she does not compute with. It's not something that she's accustomed to. And, and also knowing that there wasn't another religious man like him in his background that would ever speak to her. So he was brave. He was prepared to hear her say again, like I said a moment ago, he was prepared to hear her say, get out of here. I don't need a conversation with you. But it led to something. So be brave. The fifth is this. Be imaginative. In a way, when you're looking for those opportunities to speak, and let me just give you an example. You have conversations about what's going on in the world today. We're talking about war. You know what? It's a great segue to talk about the kind of peace that we can have, a, a peace that can come from only Jesus Christ. Think about that for a moment. You can almost take any conversation you have with people and it leads them to that place of talking about Jesus. I've even had conversations with people that want to talk about sports. And I talk about reaching the goal in life, about what it means to finish the, the race well. It's an easy segue to go into that conversation with folks. Yeah, I, I hear people talk about being stressed out to the max and how life is so hard. And man, sometimes it is. And you have the opportunity in those moments to talk about that lasting peace that comes from Jesus Christ. These are all ways for you and I to speak truth into their lives. Being imaginative, to use the same leading every time is not always good. Can I just tell you that? I thought about this last week when I was preparing this message. I thought to myself, you know, I could just say to everyone here this morning, just use John, just use John chapter four. Just use, just use the, the woman at the well, right? Perfect one. Always use that. You know, you go to somebody, hey, can I have a glass of water? And they look at you like, what are you talking about? You want a glass of water? There are always different ways to be, to speak the truth of Jesus Christ in the people's life. Now, I, I was raised probably in some ways the way that you were. And, and, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more next week because there's not enough time today. 
How many of you ever grew up with the four spiritual laws? Any, any of you ever walked through that in your life? Yeah, I, I'm, all of us that are, well, so I, I'm 55 and the rest of you are like 85. Okay, so I, I, I jumped a generation somewhere. You're not 85, I'm just kidding about that. But you know, it became such a help to me because I'm a rambler. And, and, and I just go off on all these different tangents and these four spiritual laws, they, they help me. It helped me to remind myself of, how, of what my message needs to look like. Now, you don't have to have these four spiritual laws and use them every time. But let me tell you what they are because you can use this as your foundation, at least, for how you're going to talk to people. Let me just give them to you. The first spiritual law is simply this. You look at them and you say, hey, you know, listen, I got four spiritual laws for you. No, don't interrupt me. I've got four of them, right? So that's how I got, that's how I got to get started. Listen, I've got four things and I don't want to be interrupted until I get through all four. <laughs> yeah. And that, that normally ends the conversation right there. But listen, there are four things. Four things that you want to make sure that they know. And the first is this, is that God loves you and God has a plan for your life. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son. And the second law, the, se the second spiritual law is that man's sinful nature separates us from God and for our ability to know what his perfect plan is for our life. That's the second spiritual law. The third one is, oh, and by the way, here's good news, is that God sent his son to, to deal with that separation so that you can know what his perfect will for you is. And the fourth one is simply this. You have to be willing to make a decision you have to choose what you will do with Jesus. Now remember I said to you earlier, those were the four spiritual laws. Those are the things that we're gonna talk about next week. But I wanna to talk to you about something else that changed my life too. And it kinda of came down to this. I used those four spiritual laws so much that I found myself that I was no longer imaginative. I was, I was just kinda of always focused on just those four things. I've come to the point where there's, there's three things that I think I could just put everything together. And that is, the first is just to understand the problem of man. And the problem of man is, is that he is dead in his sins. That's the problem. The second thing is, there's good news that God has made a way for us to know Jesus Christ. And it's through Jesus. And the third is that there's an encounter that you get to have with him if you so choose to experience that with him. There's three things. What you are in your sins, what God has done to make a way, and you get to make a decision to choose him. Folks, along with your testimony, along with your sharing, your natural, your listening, your being vulnerable, your being brave, the message doesn't always have to be a cookie cutter approach, but the focus of the message sometimes because you don't always get to have that abundance of time with them. It is important that you understand what are the main things that they need to know. And those three things are important. That there's a problem with you because there was a problem with me. It's a problem with every human being in this world and that we have a sin problem. And that we can't fix it on our own. But good news, God has made a way. And now you get to decide. And brothers and sisters, that means that you don't have to be a walking Bible encyclopedia and you don't have to be a walking Bible dictionary. But you have a message to give. Next week, what we're going to do is we're going to add the scripture to that. To help us to understand even clearer, how do I share that? Not just in my words, but using the authority of scripture to show them the truth and the way. And I tell you this. My thought was a week ago that I would add this message with next week's message and go through it very, very quickly. And I said to myself, why would we go through something so quickly as if it's not important enough to give us its diligence and its meaning? And so if this is a little too boring for you, then be, be patient. Because brothers and sisters, there's a world out there and there are people out there who the message that they hear from you may be the only message they ever hear. And it matters that we get it right. Because through his power and through his spirit and through us, God can change lives. Now let me say this too. God doesn't have to use you. He doesn't have to use me. But he so chooses to make us part of that link in the chain 
so that other people might know him. Listen, some of this stuff you could just add. And by the way, I told you there was five and there's a sixth one I'm just giving to you. Be decisive. Don't, don't sit down and start going through the Trinity, the second coming, and what it means to understand the tribulation. Be clear in what your message is. That's why those three things became so important to me. Man's problem, God's ability to fix it, and our decision to choose him. That makes that message so direct and so decisive. So when you think about how do I share Jesus, it's not that hard. We make it hard because we don't want to, because we're not brave, because we're not vulnerable, because we don't listen, because we're not natural. I hope this makes sense to you this morning. I pray that God will allow you to use that to to touch that neighbor, to speak that truth into that that person at school. I I pray that that even thinking about next weekend when we gather together outside on the lawn, that you've you, you just have that opportunity to, to speak to that neighbor or that un, unsaved friend that you have that, that they might feel because of what they see in you, what you said to them, might lead them to that, that opportunity to hear more about Jesus, to be found faithful with the gospel message is what we're here for. And I pray that you use it. Would you stand with me this morning? And as we sing together, oh, would you just pray that the Lord might give you those divine opportunities, those moments that you didn't expect were gonna come your way, but only because of what God can do, he puts that person in your life. You know, I've to, I, I told somebody the other day, I said, I'm sure that I won't be with you very long here at MPMC because now that I've shared all of my stories, you're so bored of it that you're ready to find somebody else to come and tell new stories. I keep going back to my friend who so desperately wanted to talk about Jesus because he didn't know him. And I gave him his, my spiel about the Trinity and the second coming and all that kind of stuff. And he just looked at me dazed and confused. I don't think I ever told you why he finally chose to accept Jesus Christ. He finally shut me up and said, Dave, what I find is, is that I know that there is a Jesus who lives in you and he doesn't live in me. And I just want to know that Jesus. So let's pray. That's what he said. <laughs> And here I had prepared so much to share, and I still had more to share. But he didn't need that right then. He just needed to know that he was a man like all other men, dead in their sins, that there's a remedy, and that remedy is Jesus. And he just needed to know, how do I ask? How do I make that decision? Sometimes it's just that easy. Sometimes it will be blood, sweat, and tears for long periods of time. And you may have to fight the battle. You may have to wake up in the middle of the night with conviction upon your heart that just doesn't allow you to sleep because it's such a burden. But brothers and sisters, at the end of the day, I promise you this. All that work, all that sacrifice, all that boldness, all that vulnerability, all that being natural, all that being listening, it is worth it in the end. Let's sing together this morning. Here's my life I lay down Here's my life I lay down I lay down surrender it all to you. I surrender it all to you. I surrender it all to you. I let go and give it to you. I surrender it all to you. I 
I surrender it all to you. Let go and give it to you. Here's my fear. I lay it down. Here's my fear. I lay it down. I lay it down. I surrender it all to you. I surrender it all to you. I surrender it all. I surrender it all to you. I surrender it all to you. I surrender it all to you. I let go and give it to you. Here's my life. I lay it down. Here's my life. I lay it down. I lay it down. So grateful for men in my life who was willing to go through the hard stuff to be the voice, to be the life that spoke into my life that would lead me to that day that I would choose Christ. And I tell you that for this reason. If you've been with us on Wednesday night, um, we've been going through the book of Job. Brothers and sisters, it's hard to imagine that people go through a life and experience what Job experienced. I can't imagine going through the struggles of life without the presence of God. I don't know how people live like that. And when I think about the power, and I think about the strength that he gives to us in those moments, I think about how desperately I want others to have that strength, to have that boldness, to have that courage. Because sometimes we don't have answers to why things happen in our lives. But we certainly serve a God who does. And I don't know about you, I know some of you, and I know the season of life that you're in right now, and I know the season of life that I'm in right now. And I know that whatever is to come, God is a faithful God, and he will give to each of us exactly what we need, because he is a gracious God who loves us, who made a way to bring us into that relationship with our Heavenly Father. And that's good news. Let me pray for you. Father, even in these moments right now, we glorify you. We give you all the praise and we give you all the glory. That, Lord, that you empower us, you strengthen us, you you enlighten us with your word to give us hope that we might be able to share that same hope with others. And I pray, Lord, I pray that even tomorrow, I pray today, that when those opportunities come our way, oh, that, Father, that you would give us every word to speak, every action in our being, Lord, that we would would testify to the goodness of who Jesus is. Oh, Father, remind us of that every single day, that when that opportunity is there, that we take advantage of it. That, Lord, even if it would matter to one life, that one life would be worth it in the end. And for that, Lord, today, we hunger and we thirst after those chances, those opportunities. Give us, Lord, your strength that it might bring all glory to you. And Father, it is in your precious and in your wonderful name that we pray. And all God's people said, God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful day in the Lord.